Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Let's look at Senate Bill S-236, which is titled An Act to Amend the Criminal Code, the Criminal Records Act, the National Defense Act, and the DNA Identification Act. So this is not law at this point, but one particular senator hopes it will be. Sometimes people say, Runkle, why don't you go into politics? We think you'd make a great politician. And I will tell you, I have a fatal flaw for politics. That is that I'm not a party loyalist. I will not say one party can do no wrong and the other parties can do no right. I will call out stupid wherever I see it. And frankly, I could not be brought to vote for certain stupid things, no matter how much my party said you have to. So I'd get bounced in a hurry. The reason why I mention this is that this particular bit of authoritarian stupidity comes to you from the Honorable Senator Carignan, who is a Conservative Party of Canada Senator. He was appointed by Harper. Let's have a look at what this bill does. So summary, this enactment amends the Criminal Code, the Criminal Records Act, the National Defense Act, all of those things I mentioned before, to promote the DNA collection system and increase the number of DNA profiles stored in the National DNA Data Bank. All right, so it's also got a preamble here that we'll have a look at. Preamble is not law. A preamble can, however, inform a judge as to how to apply provisions where they're not clear. But mostly a preamble just tells, it tells the public, here is why we think this bill is important. So they say, whereas the National DNA Data Bank was created to help law enforcement agencies identify persons alleged to have committed designated offenses, that's not really correct. It's created to help law enforcement agencies identify persons to, so that they can allege that those people have committed offenses. And it says designated offenses here. I'll get to what that means because it's going to be important in terms of analyzing what this bill does. They say, whereas the effectiveness of the National DNA Data Bank depends on the number of DNA profiles in the convicted offenders index to be compared to the DNA profiles in the crime scene index, they're saying this will be more effective if we have more DNA samples to compare against. They say, whereas Canada has, on a per capita basis, far fewer DNA profiles in the convicted offenders index of its national DNA data bank than the national DNA data banks of other free and democratic countries, resulting in fewer chances of identifying the perpetrators of serious and violent crimes. Now, I don't think Canada actually solves fewer serious and violent crimes than other countries. But another thing here is that we can measure freedom in part based on the degree to which the government doesn't surveil its populace. So Canada, what this tells us is that Canada actually enjoys more freedom than some of these other countries. I wonder which countries they're identifying as free and democratic countries. Like, are they looking at the UK, you know, the home of, hey, have you got a license for that permit? or where you can't pick your nose out in public without being watched by 17 different video cameras? Is that what they're talking about? The place where the, the police want to ban knives with a point so that you'd have to be running around with, you know, rounded off kitchen knives? That free and democratic country? Yeah, it's hard to say. They don't identify which free and democratic countries they're talking about here. They also say, whereas the use of familial searching has been instrumental in solving horrific crimes in other free and democratic countries. Now, there's a lot of bullshit going on here. And part of the bullshit is when they say other free and democratic countries are doing it. Well, yeah, that is a terrible argument. You know, everyone else is doing it. Why can't we? It's because you know that this is a bad deal. And so you're trying to sell it based on this bad argument. And when they raise horrific crimes, well, yeah, okay. That's usually the argument that they make in order to restrict freedoms. These bad things are happening. We have to do something. This is something. So let's do it. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised they didn't go ahead and try to name this bill after a dead child or something like that. That is usually the way they, they want to promote these terrible things. All right. So let's see what it starts with doing, which is replacing the definitions of primary designated offense and secondary designated offense. Now, I know I said, hey, I would explain what those are. So let's look at what those are currently, and then we can see how they're changing it. So currently, the way those work is, and I'll just bring this up here. So primary designated offense means pretty much anything with the word sexual in it. Uh, anything that involves sex as a criminal offense, uh, very serious violence, uh, murder, manslaughter, attempt to commit murder, but also down to some much more minor or lesser violence 
Uh, for instance, assault with a weapon. So if you pull a knife on somebody, that would count. Or, you know, if you chase somebody off your property with a bat, that would count unless you can make out that that was self-defense, which can be hard. So lots of things under, you know, primary designated offense. They've also got hijacking, terrorism, seizing control of a ship or aircraft or piracy. All right, so that's primary uh, designated offenses. And now we can go and look at secondary designated offenses, which have a, a less serious impact. So assault with a weapon was on primary. Simple assault is on secondary. Uh, there's various sort of other elements setting traps here. Assault on a peace officer. Now that would be assault that doesn't cause bodily harm. Uh, yeah, so it has a big list. I don't, I'm not really a big fan of this whole sort of listing things out strategy. However, I am a bigger fan of this notion that this creates effectively three tiers. Tier one is the most serious stuff, primary designated offenses. Tier two is less serious stuff, secondary designated offenses. And then tier three is this category of things that are not primary and not secondary. You know, mischief. If somebody carves their name into, you know, a bus stop seat, maybe we don't need their DNA. You know, maybe this isn't the crime of the century and somebody who deserves to be tracked uh, forever after. All right, so let's go back to the bill to see what, uh, what it proposes to do. So primary designated offense means any offense that may be prosecuted by indictment. Note, maybe, not is. So lots of offenses in Canada contemplate that there will be more serious and less serious iterations of that. And so they say, you know, regardless of whether the Crown thinks it's the more serious or the less serious version, we're going to treat it as if it was the most serious. And for which the maximum punishment is imprisonment for five years or more, including summary conviction offenses that may also be prosecuted by indictment created by one of the following acts. Now, keep in mind, lots of lots of laws in Canada have this huge range of stuff that they cover. Let's consider section 88 sub 1 of the criminal code, possession of weapon for purposes of dangerous to the public peace. There is no mandatory minimum penalty for this, which means the judge can say you did it, but you're not going to do any jail time. You're not going to do any probation. You're not going to pay any fines. You don't even get a criminal record. So you did it. You shouldn't have done it. Please don't do it again. But this isn't deserving of any punishment. However, if the Crown proceeds by indictment, the maximum penalty is 10 years. You might think, why such a big range? Well, it can cover a wide range of activities. At one extreme, we can imagine a drug dealer who's found on his way to a rival drug dealer's house. He's got weapons. He's got duct tape. He's got lye. He's got bleach. He's got all of these things that suggest that when he gets to his destination, some really bad stuff is going to go down. So that person, I think, is deserving of a really high sentence somewhere way up the scale, especially if they've done this before or if they've had other violent convictions. Whereas the offense also would include somebody, for instance, a woman who has to walk home late at night and who decides to carry a weapon to protect herself because she is concerned that other people will commit serious violent offenses against her. Our parliament, in its infinite wisdom, has decided that that should be a crime. And this particular senator has decided that not only should that be a crime, but that this woman's DNA needs to be forever preserved in a DNA data bank so that we can monitor her, monitor her more closely. I kind of disagree with that. I think that, you know, A, that should be legal, but if it's not legal, I kind of feel like she doesn't, you know, she's not the person that we're really thinking of when we think of a DNA data bank. Now, let's move on to look at what secondary designated offenses would change to, which is everything else. It says any offense other than a primary designated offense that they can proceed maximum penalty of less than five years. So anything in the criminal code that is not a primary designated offense would be a secondary designated offense. So that possession of weapon for purposes of danger to the public peace or somebody who carves their name into a mailbox or anything at all. I think that's maybe a little overreaching. They also want to change the test for when the court should make the order. So let's have a look at what this would do by looking at what's going on right now and how they'd change it. So order primary designated offenses. The court shall make such an order, which means the court must make the order. However, there is an escape valve on that. It says, however, the court is not required to make the order if it is satisfied that the person has established, which means that the burden is on the accused here, 
that the impact of such an order on their privacy and security of the person would be grossly disproportionate to the public interest in protection of society and the proper administration of justice to be achieved through the early detection, arrest, and conviction of offenders. So not just disproportionate, but grossly disproportionate, and the burden is on the accused. That's a tough burden to make. So primary designated offenses almost always mean that your DNA is getting collected. But let's look at secondary designated offenses and people who are found not criminally responsible. The test here is that the court may, on application by the prosecutor, and the prosecutor will usually make that application, and if it is satisfied that it is in the best interest of the administration of justice to do so, make an order for DNA collection. And they say, in deciding whether to make the order, the court shall consider the person's criminal record, whether they were previously found not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder for a designated offense, the nature of the offense, the circumstances surrounding its commission, and the impact such an order would have on the person's privacy and security of the person, and shall give reasons for its decision. So basically, a secondary designated offense is a lesser category. It says that this is a category where the court can decide that they want to impose it, but that they don't have to. Let's have a look at what the new language would say. I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit for clarity. The court must make an order for DNA collection from any person, including a young person, who is convicted, discharged, or found to be not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder of a designated offense that, first, is a primary designated offense. Full stop, no exceptions. So if we think back to the example of the woman who has to walk home late at night, not a great neighborhood, she's afraid, she carries a weapon, even if the court said, listen, the appropriate penalty is not to punish you and not even to keep a criminal record, they'd have to take her DNA and that would have to go into the DNA data bank. And I'm thinking maybe this woman isn't who I'm afraid of. Maybe this woman isn't the top priority for government surveillance. But let's look at what they do with secondary designated offenses, which were previously something where the court could say, we can impose it, but we don't have to. Now that's this, they've changed the test to what used to be the test for primary designated offenses. So it would be that a, you have to establish, and it's your burden, that it would be grossly disproportionate. And keep in mind, they've eliminated that third category of just offenses that we don't need DNA for at all, which used to include things like, you know, petty vandalism. So now if a child commits an act of petty vandalism, and you know, when I think back to the stories my dad told me of his childhood, you know, they got up to all sorts of pranks that could count as criminal offenses that would now count as secondary designated offenses and would end up with DNA databank collection. I'm thinking that this isn't really our concern. This is way more surveillance than we actually want as a society. Now, you might be thinking, well, this doesn't affect me. You know, I didn't get up to anything troublesome as a kid. I was never, you know, busted with any sort of criminal activity or anything like that. And so I'm not going to be in this. I'm going to just follow the law and no problems. Well, you kind of will still be in the database. Why? Because profile comparison, biological relative. If a comparison of a crime scene profile with the convicted offenders index has not produced a match, an investigating authority, so the police, the government of a foreign state, think about that one, an international organization established by the governments of states or an institution of such government or international organization, think about that as well, you know, who that covers, uh, may request that the crime scene profile be compared to the convicted offenders index to determine if it could be the profile of a biological relative of someone whose DNA profile is in the convicted offenders index. So right now, those groups can already check to see if you're a match. But now, it's not just are you a match, but are you a match to somebody who is a relative of somebody in the database? So you don't have to have committed a crime. You know, you might have a troublesome brother or sister or, you know, maybe your parent got up to bad things. They would end up, you know, because their DNA is in the database, that ends up pointing to you too. So they say preconditions. Now, keep in mind, uh, when we see these preconditions and you're going to say, oh, well, this provides all sorts of useful limits. Well, how long is it until they bring another bill to get rid of all these entirely? Because we've already seen them wanting to expand, you know, this DNA collection. Pretty soon they're going to want to eliminate these limits. I can guarantee it. 
So the commissioner may conduct the comparison requested under subsection one if the commissioner is satisfied that first it's being made in connection with an investigation into a designated offense or an offense that would be a designated offense if it occurred in Canada for which the person may be sentenced to imprisonment for 14 years or more. So we're saying we're not going to look it up for, you know, petty vandalism yet. Other investigation procedures have been tried and have failed or are unlikely to succeed or that the urgency of the situation requires the comparison of the profile to others. I can guarantee you they're going to say that this is super urgent all the time. That's just how police operate. Uh, we can see that with regards to how they deal with search warrants under the firearms provisions. So, yeah, I'm not super convinced that this bit here is going to provide us with much protection. And communication, if in the commissioner's opinion, the DNA profile compared under subsection 2 could be the profile of a biological relative of someone whose DNA profile is in the convicted offender's index, the commissioner may communicate to the entity that made the request any information regarding the profile in the convicted offender's index that the commissioner considers appropriate for the purpose of aiding the investigation. So, it doesn't matter if you committed the offense yourself, if a relative commits an offense, they're going to potentially be able to look this up. And you might say, well, why do I care? I'm not committing offenses for which the you know penalty is 14 years or more. But you don't know what ends up at a crime scene. You could be walking down the street and you could say, listen, you know, I'm drinking a can of pop and you're done with it and you commit the terrible, heinous offense of littering. And so that can of pop ends up on the road. And then somebody commits a murder there. You better believe that they're going to come knocking on your door going, can you explain why your DNA was found on a can at a murder scene? The other thing is that there is great potential for misuse of all this information. You know, oh, the government would never misuse this. Well, that is a dumb argument. And it's not just me that thinks it's a dumb argument. The Supreme Court has regularly said that this is a dumb argument. We need to assume that governments are not necessarily acting in our own best interests. The courts have basically rejected this argument of government discretion in the case of the Queen and Nur. But keep in mind, I mean, we've already seen the RCMP with the long gun registry. They said, oh, yeah, we got rid of it. They never got rid of it. That's still around. And so, you know, they're going to do checks. They just might not tell us they've done the checks. Keep in mind as well the potential for checks into things that may not be... Uh, may not be as concerning. You know, let's say you attend a protest because you are big in favor of whatever issue, you know, gun rights, whatever. Um, you know, think of an issue for or against that, you know, whatever side, maybe the RCMP decides they want to investigate this and maybe they want to go through and collect, you know, leftover, you know, pop cans, cigarette butts, whatever they can find and run that just for their own purposes. If your DNA is in this data bank, they can find out that you were there or maybe that you were there in the hours before the protest happened. You might get tracked down and, you know, thought to be doing something or involved in something that you were never actually involved in. So all of this information has tremendous potential to be misused. Keep in mind that once we also consider the family and biological relatives aspect, this is going to be an ever growing database, essentially. Because once they've got one of your family members, they sort of have that lead to track down the rest of the family members. So essentially, at some point, you know, down the road, this will end up with a DNA data bank that can identify or nearly identify every Canadian. I have a big problem with this. This should not exist. This is a very bad idea. Now... You know, you might be thinking, did this particular senator think about the military? And you bet he did. He had special thoughts about the military because this is to offend or to amend the National Defense Act to allow for DNA collection for court martials as well. So he's thought about the military. He wants military members in this DNA data bank as well. So... Yeah, that's uh, also in there. There's some provisions about destruction, which basically don't allow for it to be destroyed. And this is a really, really concerning bill. Uh, I, I hope this bill dies. I hope it goes nowhere further. Um, feel free to write this senator and let them know, especially if you are, you know, if you're a conservative voter, let them know that, you know, I'm a conservative voter. 
I don't think that this is a good idea. I think that the government needs to get out of our business. There's a further um, provision here, and I'm just trying to track it down here. Here we go. So this report of the minister, this is the last little bit that they want to put in here. The Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness must examine and prepare a report on the advisability of taking a DNA sample on the same basis as fingerprints taken under the Investigation of Criminals Act. So not only do they want to take your DNA simply if you've been convicted of an offense, and keep in mind that the familial provisions also basically include you if your brother or other person has gotten into trouble, they also want to make it even if you are arrested wrongfully. So think about that. You know, we'll, I've mentioned Ian Thompson in the past. Ian Thompson was charged with crimes for defending himself in what I consider to be one of the clearest of cases, and he was ultimately exonerated. But they would say, we need Mr. Thompson's DNA. We should have had that, and we want that going forward. Uh, they would also, you know, I covered a case that was a very clear example where a woman was being attacked and killed her attacker, but it was very clear that she was defending herself. They called it the clearest of cases. Her DNA would have ended up in the profile. And that's, to me, a really big problem. We don't need this level of surveillance state in our life. And this is a really, really bad bill. So I, uh, I wanted to share it with you, let you know that this is something that was proposed. Right now, I don't think it's likely to go anywhere simply because it's a conservative launched bill in a time where we have the liberal government in power. But governments tend to like proposals to expand their own power and authority. So I can't say for certain that the liberals wouldn't say, you know what, this sounds like a great idea. This is going to give us tremendous power and information. Let's go for it. Similarly, I don't expect that the liberals will be in power forever. So one day we may see a conservative government and they may say, hey, you know what? This sounds like a great proposal. Let's go and create this giant surveillance state, this engine of knowing what everybody is doing. I think these things need to be pushed back on and pushed back on hard if we are to preserve any liberty for things like just free expression. You know, I may not always agree with pro what protesters are doing or their views, but I think it's a good thing that we have protests. You know, people should be able to protest without necessarily worrying about whether the government is going to be going through and picking up their cast-offs and throwing them into a database. <sighs> yeah, I, this is a real bad bill, and I guess that's about it. Thank you for watching. Please like this video. Please share it with your friends. Subscribe to see more content. I'm going to be a little slow in the next upcoming days in terms of getting content out because I'm preparing for a big court date, but uh, just wanted to let you know. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters. Uh, that'll be in the description below if you want to contribute. I'll also link to the, the proposed bill itself. Uh, at the $50 level, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Jason Elliott, D. Mo, Canada's National Farms Association, North Central Process Service, Kyle Martin, Jean-Guy Toussaint, Ivo Nedev, Christopher Molina, the CCFR, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sites and Arms Limited and Mark Olivier Damour. And at the $20 level, Matt Ward, Mark Whittington, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, and Adam Meester. Thank you as well to everyone at the $10 level who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge.